Call to order the City Council work session for the City of East Grand Forks for Tuesday, November 9th, 2021. It's now 5 o'clock. Would City Clerk please call roll? Here. Council President Mark Olson? Here. Council Vice President Tim Rietko? Here. Council Members Claire and Sutter? Here. Dale Helms? Tim Johnson? Here. Mark Tamers? Brian Larson? Here. Does term quorum. We're going to switch things around a little bit. We're going to start with number two. Uh, request to host snowmobile races and we have Corey here with us today if you want to kind of explain what your uh, idea is and what you're looking for and then if people have questions they can okay um so uh I, my son is involved in a race circuit called kc pro west um and they hold diff hold races in different areas around the surrounding area and they asked me if i was willing to host a race in east grand forks um and i said i'd give it a shot um we're looking for a chunk of land that east grand forks would be willing to let us use for a weekend it'd be a saturday and sunday race um we would do all the work as set up uh the club would also put a blanket liability um on the property for that weekend so the city is not involved if anybody ever were to get hurt or anything like that but we're just looking for some place to hold it um we i talked to a few different people for some different ideas um one of the main areas that was looked at was the boat landing down by the river uh, because i was told the city also dumps snow there if we were on a year where we have a lack of snow um there'd be snow accessible there um but we do the setup uh like the groomer uh, i already talked to i forget the organization that um does it but the polk county grooming or groomers they would be willing to groom the track for us uh andy zavarall said he if we needed to get some other equipment in here to move snow he would be willing to help out with that also so um, you're looking to do this what january january 22nd and 23rd and we'd probably set up the track wednesday or thursday of that week prior to the weekend how many so, people usually participate uh it varies uh there's a few different race circuits so it all depends on what other race circuits are doing um it could be you know the well racers i'm guessing anywhere from 20 to 40 racers um and then the age group i believe is 5 to 14. so mm -hmm. no concessions no alcohol nothing like that it's just just looking for a piece of land to do it on a couple other pieces of land i was looking at um i live uh up by the golf course on saint andrews there's also a couple pieces of property up there that might be suitable too um if you guys weren't interested in the boat landing um we don't need a huge area but bigger the area the better so you know usually make a couple different size tracks um because there's real little kids so we'll do a small little oval for them and then for the older kids we'd like to um extend that a little bit further for a little further to ride with the kids with more experience I'm assuming you mean that land that's to the north by the golf course. There. Well, um, like I live on, uh, on the north end of St. Andrews. There's a there's a chunk of property or open area to mm -hmm. the east, um, and then also um, that water diversion that goes there, that big ditch. There's also I see you guys have just grassland in there too, um, but we need something accessible too to be able to get um, trailers and vehicles in there to get close to it because typically we'll set up a track and then um we'll all back our trailers in surrounding the racetrack so um like family members if it's cold they can just look out the back of the trailers to watch um it's not usually a big spectator sport it's more you know the f it's families that show up there so you made me Tim. Is that like the limit, like a 290 uh, cc? So they, uh, the real small ones are a 120, um, and then in the same size snowmobile, they put a 206 Champ motor, 
Um, and then we also have transitional sleds where they're they're the bigger snowmobiles, but they're they're tuned way down. They they actually have to have a computer to you know make them not go very fast. So um, I bet the kids have a fun time doing that. Yeah, yep. A friend of mine asked my son to go one time, and uh, yeah, that's all it took, and uh, he was hooked. So. But you, you'll get a lot of people from out of the area to come, typically. They try and schedule these races, uh, but weather dependent, um, so it doesn't <coughs> interfere with the other race circuits. So a lot of times you'll get people that will travel down here from, you know, Minneapolis or Brainerd. Um, but that was a nice thing that appealed to East Grand Forks or Grand Forks is uh, hotel rooms are easily accessible. So... Uh, also puts on a race usually. We usually have a race at the casino in Thief River. Um, last year we didn't, I think it was because of snow, but typically we have a race in Crookston as well. Um, Purim and Roseau. Um, just looking for new places to do it, and if it goes good, I'd like to do it every year mm -hmm. if possible. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for bringing this. I think it's great when people are bringing new attractions, bringing more people to town. Um, I think we have had snowmobile racing down in that area before. At least they set it up, and I don't know if they got got it canceled or whatever, but we've used that area for snowmobile racing before. Okay. So I don't really have a, a problem with that chunk. I'd, I would kind of work with staff to try to narrow down a couple of spots. I think that, you know, the old lagoon spot is a great spot. Um, there's a pit or a former pit on the north side of Red Lake River that's kind of down in a hollow okay. or whatever, just off of Business Highway 2. That might, it's got a it's city owned property back there that's, a, that might be a nice spot. It might give you some different trains and yep. stuff like that. I don't know what you're looking for, but just I, I would say work with staff to get this done. The only question I would have is, is this fall under kind of some of our event stuff or are we? We're not far enough along with our event permitting, so yeah, it would yeah. go back to our old stuff, or? Well, at this point, um, he has everything kind of taken care of. They just, uh, from what's being requested, they just want to use the property, and they already have the, um, the group covering the, with liability. So, I mean, as long as council gives approval to use the property, they don't need anything from staff, it doesn't sound like. We can work through that, but. I mean, but we'd still like to use our property, we should go through the mm -hmm. event. Yep. process right and that will be coming back at the next work session okay. there were some checklist items that need to be addressed but right. that will be coming back in the next work session right. so if we're working through this we can kind of work through that process and use that new process right and what's the time of day that it's i mean is it so usually? typically we temperature is also right. a factor but typically we start at like nine or ten in the morning and we're typically done you know somewhere between three and five okay so, um, like, like temperature-wise, I say that is because um, depending on how si what size the track is, but if it's really cold out, they'll cut the laps way down, and we blow right. through it real fast. If it's nicer day, try and take advantage of right. the daylight as much as possible. Yeah. How do you figure these tracks? Um, I'm sure, like Rozo and Thief River, and use their fairgrounds. Yep. And they're typically kind of confined. So how do you con configure the track or the? the so typically, um, are you, are you talking how to build it or how we come up with a plan of the direction? Well, how it's how, how it's how it's built. I'm I'm think I'm the city attorney, so okay. I'm looking at liability and yep. and I understand indemnifications and all that. But sometimes they only cover so much. Yeah. So I'm just curious on how so. They, as long as there's enough snow and we don't have to take it from a, like last year there was times where we had to take a very large area and take something and push it into a small area to get enough snow to make the track. But like if you're hauling snow down there and there's a fair amount of snow, you usually don't have to take it from very far and uh, the groomer has a big blade on the front and they would just push it make a few hills you know and level it off it usually does not take very much effort to build the track 
and then like I said because of the different age groups a lot of times they'll they'll make a real small one whether it's oval or round uh, with a few little humps on it and then for the older kids um, we'll have it blocked off with cones so they have to stay within that and then we'll we'll just make that track a little bit bigger for the older kids so they have a little further distance and more time on the track. I guess I grew up in Roseau, so I'm used to them going a bazillion miles an hour. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, so that's what I'm kind of was thinking about speed and somebody you know. launching themselves off the end of the track or <laughs> but I mean they've been doing this for a long time. I don't know the ins and outs of their um insurance policy, but I'm sure I could get you a copy of that. Um but like I said, they they blanket the whole thing, and this is the first race I've been I've sponsored. Um, but other people have done it. They they give them the insurance policy for that weekend, and they're good. So, like I said, it's it's new to me. Um, but like I also I'd, I'd like to keep doing it if it all works out. Make it a yearly thing, or. If it's good enough, maybe do it twice a year if you guys are willing. Um, it just it's it's a lot of fun, and with COVID being a problem, um, it's about the safest sport you can do out there because you're in helmets and face masks, and I mean it's not like being on the basketball court and you know sweating on each other, and you know what I mean. It's sure. It's no, a nice. I'm, I'm more how fast were they? How is it contained? Yep. Those types of things, and I can I can call Oslo, or I could call the city of Crookston and get some information. Well, you're from Roseau, Another, um, he's no longer president, but he's very, in, um, very good person. I call for um, information, but uh, Tony Wensloff, he was the president. Um, when I have questions, I usually call him because he's been part of the club for a long time. If you're familiar with who he is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Mayor, um, first of all, yeah, to echo uh, Mark's idea of bringing it here and what a great idea. I think it's really a good idea. Um, for the location, if it could be in that area along where the boat launch is or railroad tracks in, the, in that Griggs Park, I think that's an ideal location. Well, I think, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say. A Andy, yeah. Andy Zavro, I don't... I, yeah. He he's the one. He was one that really thought that was a great idea for being um, the terrain. I've never been down there. I've driven through just a little bit, but he's just like, you know, we could also go a little further out, and make a. He just thought it was a great place to do it. Yep. And I think if you're there as a family, and you're gonna have a little break between races, you don't want to like, well, gee, where do I go? Because I can nope. see it from here. I can see Cabela's. I can see the movie theater. I can see the restaurants. Having participated in a lot of like kids' hockey tournaments and stuff, if you're getting in your car driving miles, you don't maybe even know where you're going in an unfamiliar town. And this is the whole idea of having a downtown district like we have, is to bring all this stuff together. The event plus all the other stuff that supports the event is just right there. Yep. yep. And and I have thought about that over over time too. Is you know the accessibility with trailers and stuff on the edge of town would be nicer. But like you said, if they get a little break. Because depending on how many classes your kid's in, you know, sometimes you'll have a three-hour break. Well, they could go down to the Blue Moose and get lunch while they're waiting. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. That's a so. open area down there. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And there's a lot of space for parking trailers in that. Yep. They're used to trucks and boat trailers and stuff, so there's room down there. Yeah. Cool. That's all I got. Mr. Johnson? So you have to provide porta bodies? Um... Yes, at the races, uh, the club does hire somebody to bring in porta potties. And we don't need to have an ambulance or first responders down there. Yet. Um, I believe that is all set up with the club. Um, I know in in the past, um, they don't actually have an ambulance down there. Usually, they hire a EMT with a bag that sits at the races that is getting paid by the club and then if for some reason they need an ambulance they'll call in an ambulance after that but there will be a emt on site maybe uh, mr demers sorry um like when you're done with these do you guys go and like reverse groom them then or like 
Do you just it, leave them? I'm just wondering. I can. I don't know what the track looks like, but if it's got a bunch of hoop dees yeah. or whatever in it, and all of a sudden, it, if you guys would want that, we could sure do that. But most of the time, they just leave them and let the snow melt. You know, because okay. usually next time it snows or blows, it's all leveled off again anyway. Right. And just and this isn't necessary for you guys, but kind of for Megan as we do these events, like cleanup should be part of the whether it requires a deposit or something like we should make sure that there's a cleanup plan or a responsible person for cleanup and that would probably that would probably fall under me and not the club <laughs> since i'm i'm sponsoring it so this this will cost me out of pocket i gotta give the club um, 1800 or 1850 dollars I can go out and get sponsors to help with that um, but that's part of the hosting um, so I would assume they would require me if there was a deposit it'd be it would fall back on myself anybody else have any questions or no just work with the staff and I think hopefully okay. it turns out and you're able to hold it and yep that's good. Um, I mean just I guess I, when I first came here, I was thinking that we were going to have to, you know, come up with a couple different spots. But as long as you guys are good with it down there, I think that's what we'll go with, you know. And if we don't get any snow, well, then most likely they'll just be pushed off or um, come back and ask for a later date or something. Sure. So. No, appreciate it. We'll be as flexible as we can because that's a it's going to be a nice event. Yeah. So you guys are all good with yep. having a yearly thing if it everything cool. pans out. <laughs> well, as long as the mayor rides, it, yeah, <laughs> I, I can ride. It. Yeah, my my my, my yeah, son will. would just assume it'd be every weekend, but yeah, that's cool. Very cool. So, all right, thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, go back to number one, the Wave Academy presentation, Miss Larson. Hello, thanks for having me here again. I look around the room and I think most of you have heard my spiel and have seen my slides, so I don't want to be too redundant, but um, just in maybe catching up a few things and, and getting everybody else up to speed with what we have going on at the, at the high school. So we are in year two of what we call our Wave Academy. Uh, and kind of our little catch line is, well, I just plan to graduate when you can graduate with the plan. Um, I'll give you a little idea of what the rollout and all of that is, but basically the background is looking at what we are offering our kids has been kind of the same old, same old for a lot of years and really needing to collaborate with businesses and our community to say, our kids are staying here anyway, so why aren't we all investing in our future in workforce here and, and having the high school be kind of that starting point. Mark had just asked if it was ever going to go back to maybe even a middle school age and right now we're in year two so I look at um, Sean Murphy would be in our you know premier class of who started this and so they've been in ninth grade, 10th grade, we'll move it all the way up to their senior year and then we certainly have talked about moving it back into more of the middle school years. Uh, I had first heard about this with Hutchinson, Minnesota and it was really their economic development, the city and then the, the superintendent of the schools that really got it going and it's going, it's amazing what they're doing and it's really caught on around the state uh, in looking at schools similar size, Detroit Lakes is into their year three actually year four but they held their year one and continued it for another year because they weren't quite ready to move on we don't want that to happen to us we're hoping for big things and can move into our year three and and still feel like even though we're not I don't think we'll ever feel like we arrived that it's going to be in a journey that just keeps going and um, I think we've used the adage of it you know throw it against the wall if it sticks we'll do it again next year and then keep going with kind of best practice so but it is definitely a keyword collaboration uh, as I've looked at it and been working on it the last couple years I'm just realizing I'm in over my head in very many ways and so um, really needing it to be a buy-in from all of us and seeing how can we all get together to kind of do this for our, our students so Small learning environments at the high school with really kids doing the work of finding out what they, all, what they are about and then figuring out how that's going to fit into the community. So what we want our East Grand Forks to look like is having earned a diploma and we are 
you know, a leader in Minnesota. We have a high percentage of kids that graduate from high school here. We'd like to continue that. But had some sort of work-based experience or a capstone project while they're in high school. We have not been doing that for very many of our kids. The Carl Perkins money for tech ed work went away a long time ago, and the focus in Minnesota has really been the post-secondary education options, which I'm not dismissing that a lot of our kids, including my own, uh, have, have earned a lot of college credits through that and have done great things. But those kids kind of find their way sometimes themselves. Um, I always use my son as an example that went to college, always planned on doing that, but he also had a $16,000 semester of thinking he was going to be a drone pilot and deciding he hate, absolutely hated flying. So that was an expensive mistake that would not have been cool to have figured out before that happened. So, and then we're hoping that they have some sort of skill certification and college costs that are covered during this time and then have a post high school plan. Um, an example of skills certification, we have a business class and he wants to make sure, you know, because the high school is a lot of Google-based things and MacBooks and that's not really what industry is asking us to have. And so he's doing the whole work um, office what am I thinking? Work uh, Microsoft. Microsoft Office and asked about the certification for that. It's expensive. Park Construction said, we'll come in and we'll, we'll pay for it this year. So that kind of a thing to help us get that certification in for our kids. So that's pretty cool. Um, the other piece would be we have Northland that might be coming in and doing CNA or uh, first aid CPR. Zavrils has been working with us on OSHA certifications. So trying to get those things in place so kids have some work-based certification. Why now? It's like, why not now? We are long overdue for it. The more I hear about what others are doing, it's like, oh my gosh, like I wish my kids could have been in on something like this back when they were there. And I look around and a lot of you have had kids there and probably would say the same thing. We have about 60% of our kids that say they're going on to college. 25% of the jobs in Northwest Minnesota require a college degree and only 80% require only a high school diploma. So I think the college kids are gonna find their way, and I know Ron, we talked about that at one of the last meetings. This is not poo-pooing college at all, but it's saying, let's figure out what it is that you want as a career, and then let's figure out what your pathway is to get there. And if that means an apprenticeship, that means two years of college, four years of college, or beyond, then cool, then that's what you go for. But keeping in mind that when we send all of our kids on to college, a lot of them aren't completing that and they're amassing a lot of student debt. So again, just some stats to throw out there about college debt and the amount that borrows. We all kind of know that as parents, our kids paying things back and, and sometimes paying more than what their job is probably paying them in the first place. So the whole idea is career pathways. Minnesota has had this little career wheel forever that's microscopically red, but you do have a slide. So we've kind of taken the foundation of what Minnesota already did with, with this wheel and have divided our high school into some sort of a cluster based. So their second year, the world, the ninth grade, they're looking at this whole world of work and then they're moving into a sophomore year of picking some clusters within this. So currently, and I think that this is something that's a fluid thing, uh, is that we have a health and human service pathway, we have the business entrepreneurship communications, and then we have what we call STEAM, adding the arts in there. Some communities would say that's agriculture for the A. Um, the M is math, but we also would probably throw in manufacturing in there. Those are things that all fit into that. So our software is all picked one of those pathways to go into this year, one of those clusters. And they are taking a semester class this fall. Um, ideally, that would be a year-long class, but we thought, let's build it and wish we had more time, rather than, yeah, especially coming off of COVID, throwing a whole year class and having the teacher spin as they try to figure out how to fill it in. Plus, we don't have those partnerships with our community built yet. And so I, I see that that will grow, but this year it's a semester. And then the second semester, they will pick a class that uh, that complements what they took this fall. So something within that cluster range that we are designating. So those are our three areas this year. And then each, each year as the freshmen mo are moving into the sophomore year, we'll look and evaluate and say, are, is that how it's best working for us? Um, we have been doing Youth Science, which is a program that looks at career aptitude data. And I didn't include this slide in the one I showed most of you before and kind of looked at what our kids have. And you can look at what the girls are in the purple or blue and the boys are in the red. Uh, 
a lot of times kids look at those, this is what their aptitude showed that they were good at, and that's usually a better indicator than interest. Interest can change over time. Aptitudes are usually the things that already they've developed by the time they get into their ninth and 10th grade years. And I think part of it comes down to, again, of they can't be what they don't see. So when we're looking at picking careers, um, how does a girl know that she wants to be in a STEM activity when they really haven't been exposed to that much or it wasn't that cool to do that? So now we can show them the things that they can be doing and, and letting them figure out their way with what they can see. So how it works so far, a journey. Um, I kind of talked about the freshman seminar, which is a ninth grade class taught by a teacher who really looks at a relationship with kids and having tying in how school relates to the whole world of work and why this, why you're taking geometry and what that's going to mean for your future and ties in the piece that we want you here and we want you to figure yourself out. Um, we are working on right now getting those industry field trips put in for the second half of this, of this semester. The kids just finished the Northern Valley Career Expo, which you know, Mark and I were just talking about and some of you have been to. Paul plays a you know, big role in that. Um, Doing some really in-depth career exploration, we've had a ton of speakers and already our city has represented our kids well. We've had former students as firefighters come in. Um, you know, they're, it's just been amazing what we're calling on some of our graduates to come in and put a real face as to like, I was sitting here in this school and now this is how I figured out and my path here wasn't a direct line from graduating to being a firefighter, but this is why I went into it and this is why I'm still in this community. I would say, and you guys know this, I, we're at between 80 to 90% of our kids that stay in this town. They don't venture too far. When I ask them at the beginning of their senior year where they're gonna go, um, it's usually as far away from here as possible. And by the time they graduate, our kids are staying here. Or co even coming back. They maybe are going and getting educated somewhere, like chiropractic school, and still have dreams of coming back here when they're done with that. Pathways seminar would be next year. We want all of our kids to job shadow. So when we're comparing our career academy to ones around the region, we're wall to wall. We are every kid in our school from um, special ed to every single student is covered under the, the Wave Academy. Other towns like Bemidji are doing it on a, um, on a request. You don't have to. They're encouraging you and they've been very successful with that too. They have a very successful program, but it's not wall to wall and I, I think a school our size, we can, we can be serving them all and getting them way further than what they were when you know our, my kids would have graduated or yours. So 11th grade kids are a lot of them are starting the college classes and it's always hard for those kids that say, well, I must be dumb because I don't qualify for those college classes. And it's like, oh my gosh, we need to be, those are the kids. Those are the kids. Every year I have a kid that's been acting up. It's been just like, what are we going to do with these kids? They've done everything. They've taken every gym class they've had and they're going to take shop again in a gym class and they don't have any way to apply it and we've put them Zavrils for an example I took one of those kids a couple years ago and it's like I almost wanted to apologize he's been amazing he was amazing out there he he was insightful he found his he knew what he wanted to do and we didn't see behavior problems with that We've had kids go take technical classes over at Northland and it was we had to get rid of the program because it was too expensive but because it was things that we don't have at the high school. And they those, those kids weren't acting up there because they were hands on and they were doing the things that they wanted to do instead of feeling like a loser. So it, that's where we want to take this. And every year I say, this is why this program needs to work because we have those kids. Uh, and then the senior year, hopefully getting college credits, internships, certifications, maybe working with some business and industry on some sort of capstone project. So some cool stuff, hopefully. So again, the rollout's kind of the same thing. We are in year two, so we're at the sophomore level. By next year, we need to get to those job shadowings for every single student. Um, I'll, you know, we'll start with what kind of things do you want to shadow? I'll try to set those up, but it sure would be nice to have, you know, a Rolodex of sorts um, that students like, they'll come in and we'll set that up and we'll send them off and then working towards their senior year. Really working on the soft skills. We are working on character development, soft skills, so that when you get our graduates in your programs, they're gonna say, wow, they came in there, they know how to shake a hand and they know how to show up for work, be on time and do all those things. So we kind of have, we kind of set up our 10 commandments. I think we can use that word in school, but um, that's kind of borrowed from 
Detroit Lakes and have added on our own things. So what now? And this is where, like, I'm kind of stuck. I need help. Um, we are transforming the high school experience. So we, we changed to an eight period day, modified block, gave t teachers chances for labs, time for getting out into the industry, things like that. We're you know, looking at that, looking how we can change our facilities, change things around. Again, my, my thing I really want to focus on here is we're working together to foster our future talent to live, work, and play in our community and region. How are all those things? In, it, it takes all of us. It takes a village. But that's really the goal. Um, we're transforming teaching and learning. Right now, I'm in the process of setting up advisory boards for each of those co those committees. I talked with Kevin Hatcher at Water and Light at our Career Expo, and he called back and said, I thought about it all weekend. I've thought about this Career Academy. And he said, I just love this idea, and I want to be on one of the, one of the, one of the, um, advisory boards and he said I have somebody here who's an accountant that would love to come and serve on your business one and you know here's all sorts of ways you can use us that's the kind of excitement that I'm hearing you know even from you know Mark and I talk too so transforming how we do things we need those advisory boards to have people like you that are out working and saying yeah you shouldn't really be teaching that anymore because that's really antiquated we had one of our business teachers come back from DC where they just said they're totally changing how banking and finance is going to be done with all the Bitcoin and all of that and how do we stay on the cutting edge so that our kids are best trained for real world so relevant real world realistic, rigorous, relational, all those things that make a kid want to stay in school and stay in our community. And then basically the last piece is we need to transform our community. How do we get involved? How do we, how do I do this? How do I move it forward so that this is a reality and it's going to happen? Kids are excited about it. I hear parents say, man, it's so fun to hear our kids come home from Dane Chono's freshman seminar class saying, man, this is, you know, this is what we talked about in school. And so what did you learn in school today? Oh, nothing. They actually have those pieces about, do you know, well, Dave, you could say that about Sean. He kind of came home freaked out about the job I want doesn't pay enough for all the things I want to be able to do. And kind of that reality is setting in ninth grade and saying, like, what? Like, what? And But yet that's a piece of reality and it's relevant. And it's those are the things that, yeah, it shouldn't take getting to college and saying, yeah, I can't really afford the occupation I picked kind of thing. So um, and how do I, I say help? Because it is a help. Um, Looking at the advisory boards, we need businesses to be guest speakers. Externships are when a teacher goes out into business and industry and learns from you. Get us on your site so we can see what you're offering. Um, I have used the Northern Valley Machine as an example. I've used the fact that I've been here, been in this community for I don't know, 35, six years, and had never set foot on American Crystal till last year. Uh, Brian Lohr, who's lived here his whole life, said, I've never been on American Crystal until this last year. They brought us through that. I had no idea that they had a nurse on site and all the different occupations. It's like, that, that's what our kids need to hear. And how do we do that if we don't see it ourselves? So getting our teachers out into the businesses, host student faculty industry tours, get us out to your place, um, helping us with mock interviews, job shadows. I need help with brand it, branding, marketing. Those are all things kind of new to me, very new to me. Senior internship sponsorships, that whole gamut of things. I need it all. Now, how do I do it? I don't know. So where do we go from here? I guess uh, it's really nice. You know, Mark is called with his, his bank and just getting me exposure to people, getting me out to places so that we can serve on our advisory boards to say, so that you're just working maybe just with the business one and say, well, hey, have you thought of doing this? Or, you know, getting our alumni back to speak to our kids. The guest speaker things have gone over well, panels. We've had to kind of live on that because we haven't been able to get out to places. But it sounds like even Sanford had put together a whole after hours career fair for us that got postponed because of COVID. But how do we do that with an American Crystal that doesn't let someone under age 18 on site? Um, but lots of ways that we need you. And I guess I'm open to questions and next steps and also just calling me or getting in touch with me. Having me speak to your business. We've already done that with Water and Light. I'll be going over there. So that's nice for city involvement. I think one of the biggest things, you know, I know we've talked a little bit and <clears throat> things that we do at work, my job, and things that we want to do in the community, in the schools, you know, and 
I think there's, you know, as we spoke last time, we had a little get together about how many jobs are actually in a banking financial institution that people don't see, you know, and I talked about you know, our largest branch right now is our virtual branch, which is people who work in the back rooms and you don't see it from any, I mean, there's so many different areas that you don't realize. Um, but also there's, you know, opportunities to get them on site. And yes, banking is changing um, in many ways, um, you know, like every other industry, but uh, it's, there's so many opportunities for people that, even businesses in the town that people never see, they, they're they there, they drive by, but they don't know what goes on in there. And you, you mentioned that. And I think that the city, we mentioned, we talked before, the city should, you know, be part of that and say that, hey, you know, we have all these departments within our city. Maybe there's opportunities for us to do internships or job shadowing and, you know, from city administrator to public works to wastewater to working with the police and fire departments, you know, and you know, just different things. So I think there's a lot of opportunities that we could be partners with. So I don't think we can do it without you, actually. We can't. Mayor. I um I think I'm so glad you're here and, and presenting this because this really is it's a city thing, it's not a school thing. Um and when we do it right, it's a benefit to every part of our city. It's a benefit to the kids, the parents who maybe have their kids finding a good way from an earlier time. I mean, the kids find a good way, but would you rather they do it in ninth grade, get started, or would you rather they start maybe two years into college, kind of wake up and say, whoa, coulda, woulda, shoulda, like mm -hmm. you talked about with your son. I did some of that same thing when I was in college, two years of, you know, I had kind of an idea, but I didn't really know as clean as I should have been how to attack it and how to go at it. Um, so I think it is really important to start this from an early age. And on the city side of it, um, I think we're going to be able to help a lot with the business partnerships that you're looking for um, through our EDA, also with our connections too with the Chamber of Commerce, which you guys mm -hmm. have some of that already going. But anything we can help to facilitate that, we're definitely going to be willing to help with that. And I liked what something you said earlier, um, in addition to guiding, you said it actually when we met um, a month or so ago, you know, not only do you guide them to a good curriculum for them early on, but when they get out into a business and that business says, you know, you're going into the construction trades, I'm making up an example, or maybe it was your example, you need to be able to do Excel spreadsheet. And now all of a sudden they come back in the classroom and Excel spreadsheet is way more interesting to them because, oh, I need it. It's irrelevant. Yeah, it's not just theoretical, I really need this. So they're hungry for it, now they sit back down and they just attack it and learn it way quicker. So that's okay, now you remember that from my first presentation. Yeah. That's impressive. That yeah, that's Excel cool. Spreadsheet and I think that can happen a lot yeah. in a lot of different ways. The other thing I want to mention is that Grand Forks has approached us. You know, they have the Impact Academy uh, that that's on the newspaper every day, and it's amazing. And there's a lot of communities that are doing big things, big buildings like that. And Eric Ripley came and met with uh, Superintendent Colness and uh, Brian Laura, our principal, and myself uh, a couple weeks ago, and just kind of feed, feeling us out as to where we see ourselves. And if you had asked me at one of the last couple of meetings, I would say, I don't know, like we didn't think that we belonged there or that we could. But that door is opened in terms of, the, it's the river that divides. So we are talking two different states and we're not exactly sure how that can work. But definitely don't want to poo-poo the idea of being able to use utilize their state-of-the-art facilities. But what I think what we're doing that's a, that is different is that we have some programming. We have the programming behind it. We're not a building, we're a program. And some of those other things might come. Like I think in our construction trades this next year, they want to build a tiny house. They've built it now from a shed to the tiny house thing and they'll be doing the whole architecture piece of that. Some schools have found their little niche and that's what exactly what they've been doing and have made it into an industry. Uh, and I don't know if that's where we'll be or not, but I maybe. We'd also like to see a community service piece to that where they buy into that if I'm part of a community I give back so whether Sherlock Park becomes our thing because we were had a hand in building that years ago or there's some other need but kind of that you see us doing giving things back as well as receiving so maybe have any questions mr. Demers mm -hmm. questions comments um, just was wondering you know you talked about 
Hutch and Detroit Lakes has got a good program going. Are there specific things that their cities or their utilities are doing? Like specific examples of what they are, is there funding opportunities? Is there, you know, specific actions that they're taking at the city level to promote these, or what should we be doing? Like, what's the action that we Thank you. should that, take on? That's here? a good segue into this because I'm always told don't shake your hand and then reach for your wallet. Yeah. But okay, you kind of open that door. Um, we don't have the sponsorship piece set up yet. Bemidji started off with the sponsorship. They said, we have this great idea. People bought into the idea and they're like, okay, do you want to have this level, this level, this level? You walk into their atrium and it would show, you know, what level you contributed to. And that total, that project totally funds itself. They don't use school dollars for their academy. Again, it's not wall to wall and it doesn't have as much of the programming piece. So at some point, Obviously, some sponsorships are going to have to be a piece. We can't do this without that. We need even in-kind things. Um, a business is getting rid of their 3D printer, and they'll say, it still works great, but we're moving on to this. Do you have a need for it? So looking at that kind of thing. Um, we've had kids already going out to you know Zavros to do use the ladders and do some of that with some of the certifications. So it's that kind of a partnership as well. So where we go from here, I think is finding out where you are at as each business and how you see yourselves fitting into our dream, our community dream. Um, and then how do we work together to, you know, it'll be different. And again, maybe we're taking baby steps now. Maybe some of you have some great ideas as to, I think you should go right into the sponsorship thing, or I think you should write, you know, that's where I need direction as to where do we, how, where do we go? It's, it's big and it, yeah, I need help with that. Hey, Mills, have any questions? I guess I would toss in two cents. I'd say I'd go sponsorship sooner than later, especially since you already have a program running. It's not just a dream. I mean, you've got students already in the hopper, you know, progressing through. So I feel like you could go to the sponsorship piece anytime, and then it would start to take off. Cause you so maybe we need, like, even an advisory board that's just for the overall academy, and then each of the clusters could have one, too. So we've got those visionaries that are saying, we're your dream team, and we'll help you get that part of it organized. So I'll add that to that, because I think there is an umbrella that fits over even the other ones, and if there's people that have that business know-how or know how to structure that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? I'll just end by saying that uh, I, I can say that my son is very firmly in the STEAM camp. That's the one that he, he the only one he really found interesting. He's, the other ones just looked boring to him. <laughs> cool. Nice to know. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming in. Thank you, you again. I know a lot of you have heard it twice, but I hope that you look at things in the community in a different way to say, oh, maybe that would work. And you can be like Kevin Hatcher who said, thought about it all weekend. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank thanks you. for coming. Thank appreciate you. it. Uh, we'll move on to number three, request to purchase patrol SUV. Chief Headland. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, hope I'm not putting the cart before the horse here, but I guess in a little bit of a way I am. We've typically waited to make requests to purchase large capital items until the budget has been finalized, but with uh, you're all, I think, well aware of the, the situation with vehicles in the country right now. Um, we were even advised by, recommended by our, our, our supplier that we put in our request to, to get our uh, vehicle ordered earlier. For our capital improvement plan in 2022, we have just one one squad car uh, scheduled to be replaced. And so basically I'm re requesting to get authorization Assuming that, you know, I guess I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to get the, the one vehicle in the final budget, and we'd like to get that ordered now, just so we can hopefully get it a little bit quicker. It's, it's the, I think the longer we wait, the further out into 2022 it's going to actually be. So. Yeah, I've I've talked to people who've ordered in January and they still haven't got their vehicles. Yeah. I've talked to people who ordered in May and they're hopefully going to get them next month. But so it just varies. Yeah. Very much so. so. They said it could be as little as 20 weeks. They said many vehicles, I shouldn't say many, but they said a number of vehicles are, are taking a full year to get. But they anticipated it would probably be about 20 weeks for a squad car. A lot of the communities are doing this from what I've been reading. Well, that's what I, that's part of my worry and, and one of the reasons I brought it forward now because the more that jump on board and do that, if we wait, it puts us that much further down the road. Any questions for Chief Headland? I have one. 
yeah. on the year where you've done one squad vehicle. Um, that's a year where you've done some additional technology purchases or other things to sort of level out your budget. Are you going to be doing that for next year? Um, I don't have my capital improvement request with me, but we don't have a lot that's due for next year. Just in our, and of course, we're normal replacement. There's not much that's due right now. We're, we're pretty up to speed. I believe another year, it's, I think it's one year out further, is when we will be doing the body cams and in-car videos again. But we're still able to get those covered under our extended warranty that we've been paying for each year. That's worked well, and it's it's able to push out the larger expense a little bit longer. And as long as they're still willing to do that for us, um, it's WatchGuard is the company that we use for both of those, and it's it's been good equipment for us. And if we have one go down, they replaced it, no questions asked. It's been, it's been I think, worth the money we've spent for the extended warranty warranty each year. We just we re have renewed each year so far. I think we're eligible for one more year after this. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Mr. Demers. Do we have to pay anything up front or no. is it? Okay. Nope. And then is this the the squad that has had the electrical problems or? No, that okay. one it hasn't been perfect, but it has largely seems to have resolved itself. Okay. Once in a blue moon, we still have had an issue with, but, okay. but very rarely. The one that we'd be replacing now is our sedan. Okay. That, that at this point in time will be our highest, highest mileage vehicle and our oldest. Ten it's probably the least driven um, because it's a smaller vehicle, so a lot of the officers don't necessarily like that size. And that's we're going to be switching to another SUV. Get her done. Anybody else have anything? See none, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Move on to the one minute synopsis of Mr. Gulstead. <laughs> Consider right away management ordinance. Uh, thank you. This is the uh, model right away uh, uh, or right away uh, management uh, uh, ordinance that's been requested. I've been in contact with all of the departments Nancy, uh, Keith Mickelseth. And uh, engineering have submitted it, and I would like any comments from anybody else if there's anything else that uh, seems to be uh, needed. Uh, I didn't number each section at this point. That's why there's a couple of blanks in here, depending upon where we would put it in the ordinance. Right now, I've got it under the streets and sidewalks. Uh, there's been some suggestions by engineering to put any of the, the plates in an addendum for, uh, an, excuse me, an appendix under A uh, f so that they're a part of the ordinance. I have no issues with that. Um, so, and it also covers the, uh, the uh, small cell wireless that's, that get attached to the poles uh, and uh, in, in the right of way. So. Um, that's kind of a, it covers all of it, excavations, anything that's going into the utility easements in the city, and it's all under one uh, ordinance. Do anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Gulstead on this? One minute? Oh, oh. Just, no, I'm going to go. <laughs> I had to ask something. Well, just to catch me up here, what do we have in place now, and what's, what's led us to have to formalize this? certain document uh, right now it's kind of piecemeal okay. uh, what we have and it all kind of goes through planning and zoning and then the permitting process and so what we're trying to do is designate it all in one place so that we have different corridors if it's necessary if they're congested if it's uh, and then also which on top of that is that uh, uh, with all the small cell wireless mm -hmm. we want to make sure that uh, we have that uh, tied up for for us when uh, the time comes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Move on to number five, discussion and tax abatement program. Mr. Gordy. Thank you, Mr. President. These are actually two items that are related. The first is uh, approval of the abatements from the people who paid their taxes this year and are participating in the program. Uh, that's an annual thing. We hold a public hearing, and that's set for your action next week. And included is the amount, number of recipients and the dollars involved. The second thing is the program itself is up for renewal. Uh, we last renewed it so that it is, extends to homes that are ready for, uh, ready for occupancy by December 31st of 2021. This will extend the program for another five years. But just to make something very clear, 
Uh, it takes about four years for homes to cycle through the process from the time that they uh, from the time that they are completed. If a house is completed in 2021, next year in 2022, the taxes won't be paid on a full, uh, as if it were fully constructed, they'll be paid on a partial construction or raw land or raw lot. The next year in 2023, it may come up to full value. People will pay their taxes that year and then they'll get the rebate in 2024. And for the second year of the program, the same thing happens one year down the line. So I just wanted to make sure that's clear for everybody. That's how the program operates. Uh, I talked to the school district last night. They had one question. They said, what do we need to make this happen? So uh, I would ask that you approve it and extend the program. When we talked to the realtors, when we were evaluating the programs, uh, the incentive programs that the city had, the realtors said this was the best program that we could have. What about the county? I'm sorry? Have you talked to the county? The county will want a copy of the resolution from the city and the school district before they move forward. That's the same as last time. And I, we do not anticipate it. I do not anticipate any difficulties at the county. Anybody have any questions? See none, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Number six, review updates to development agreement. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, this is before the council uh, due to a couple reasons. One is the development agreement that we currently have been using is really kind of out of date um, as far as current conditions, um, current laws, those types of things. Um, and so in the most recent development that we've had, we kind of pieced together one and negotiated a development agreement with the uh, um, McBroder Acres out there. And I think it went pretty well. Um, and so we worked with um, staff, uh, city, uh, uh, city attorney Ron Galstead and the Kennedy and Graven Law Firm. Plus we um, consulted with similar sized cities to amend and update our development agreement. So the, I guess, the, the, what we have before you tonight um, in the draft form has really two major changes. The first one is um, the removal of the option to special assess the improvements. That is really not industry standard um, really anywhere in the state anymore. Um, and it has not been for a while. Um, and I think what we've learned over the, the last uh, several projects is that um, there are, by specially assessing that, that does open the city up to some liability. Um, so I guess with that, this will help uh, alleviate that. And the second is to um, the addition of language to clarify the letter of credit and insurance requirements to protect the city from, you know, if there's defaults on, on any of these uh, any of these things. So uh, with that being said, um, we do have uh, just a couple of updates here. Um, when I was going through the final review, um, the C1 is, <laughs> there was a typo, we have to remove Shady Beach as part of the thing we, we, we had incorporated from uh, when we'd, we'd gotten. And second was to um, authorize the, to utilize bitum bituminous paving. And then the final one is should do we require a letter of credit or um, could there be any, any other options? That's something that uh, City Attorney Galstad had brought up um, for that. So I guess with that, we're looking for any feedback from the council that you might have on the proposed development agreement uh, before we make any the final revisions and hopefully bring it back for approval. One of the things that I had in here is question on, let's say we go through this process and approve it. Um, are we, <clears throat> just so we're understanding of we approve it, does it go in effect right away? How does it, is, you know, a drop dead day, this is moving forward, this is what we're doing. Is is that been discussed at all? Is that legal wise, I guess, too, is can this go in effect? Does it have to be 90 days after approval well, or when does it have to go? In? It can go into effect immediately. I mean, I guess what we, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, what we did with McBroder uh, subdivision is, is we negotiated that particular development agreement, so. Um, yeah, so you know, it, it doesn't require any kind of notif notice, um, public hearings, any of that, those types of things. So it go go into effect as soon as we approve it, I just and, and we sure. can even we can even add it to anything. So I just want to make sure everybody knew that. So I just, just Mr. Mayor, I have Mr. Riopel first. Though. Oh, so I'll hit it. I'm just looking at their insurance requirements, and I think that should be increased. Just mine as a small business, they require. Uh, 
one million, two million limit. Here they're 500,000, 1.5. I have no objection. To that. No objection to that. I think it should be increased. They're going to get hit with it anyway. The insurance companies are going to up them anyway, so we might as well do it on here. Okay. Anything else, Tim? That's it. Mayor. I know that the elimination of special assessments is a, is a big change. It would affect, if I was a developer having done business in this community, using that special assessment mechanism to do these developments, it would require a lot of internal changes for me, even to how I went at the development. I might do smaller chunks, and because I would have to pay for all the infrastructure on the front end and then recoup that as I sell the lots, so I'd have to be more intentional about you know, chunking out the development and, uh, and getting it done that way. I see a huge advantage, by the way, to eliminating special assessments for the buyer because everything's known. And as Mr. Vetter has pointed out, now if it's part of the asset that I purchased, it can go against my uh, regular home mortgage and you know, all the normal stuff. So there's a benefit to that. I see the benefit even to the developer because they don't want to be stuck in the middle of, why can't I pave my street? Here's why. The bids are coming in too high. You know, we couldn't have anticipated this. The, the concrete prices went crazy between when we started and now, and so that big element of unknown. So it's even an advantage for the developer to have those costs known right up front, build it into the price of the lot, be done with it. But it does require for them a change in how they do business, and um, it would be good for us to hear from our developers. I'm inviting that, and if anyone in the media picks up on it or whatever, um, would like to just get their feedback if this is something that they can step in and do good development. You know, the last thing we would ever want to do is create an impediment to doing development in our city. I don't think this would do that, but I'd like to hear feedback from all the developers best we can and make sure that we're going step by step in partnership with them to get a good result. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd, I tend to agree with the mayor. Um, you know, it is a, that's a pretty big shift. Even just getting into a development agreement was a big shift, but really taking the, the special assessment option off the table is a pretty, that's a pretty big game changer, I think, in the development world. Not that it's not doable, not that whatever, but I just think we better be prudent and think about all the ramifications going forward. You know. Uh, I agree with you, maybe it's not the industry standard, but we also probably aren't adding developments at what it is in, you know, in the exurbs of Saint, or the Twin Cities, seven county metro area, you know, there the demand is much higher, the pace is quicker, developers are turning, turning profit, or turning land, turning development much quicker, even if you go to the other side of the river, development turns much quicker than it does here the idea that you know keeping a developer on the hook for you know maybe 10 years out is it's a big deal and like i said i don't i'm not having you can look at my record i'm not mr pro developer on everything but i just think we need to really take a step back and obviously i mean there's problems with the special assessment process we know the, the defaulted property that we're trying to, or that the county is dealing with is kind of a, a ramification of that. I tend to think that it's kind of the exception that proves the rule of how we've done things. Um, maybe there's something that we could do to tweak it so that that sort of thing doesn't happen. I don't know. Um, I just, my fear is that we have we haven't had a new development for <laughs> added to the city for a while, you know, big, brand new, out of nowhere, you know, annexed in thing. And I would hate to put a, a wet blanket on something before it even starts. Um, so I just, like I said, I want to make sure that we think through what, what that, what that means to the developer. If that means bringing people in, if it means having Mr. Gordy go out and talk to developers or what. But like I said, I, I'm all for protecting the city's interest but the city's interest is bigger than just the city's balance sheet you know it's it's also you know the growth and and all those type of things we want people to build and develop here and it's it's an increasingly expensive game um you know and you've got to have pretty deep pockets to do it so um that's my only advice i guess 
Okay. Thanks. Anybody else have any comments? Just Mr. one. Nancy? I, I wouldn't compare us to the Twin Cities. Well, I'm just, even uh, Grand Forks. Grand Forks, they flip lots and you put a development on and they're, they fill them in two, two years. Yes, but Crooks... Here, you, fill, you do that same thing. We've got developments that have been running on 15 years. Though. No, I, I do agree with so. you, but Thief River and Crookston do do developer installed yeah. and I think that they would grow at a similar pace well, both of those guys are less population growth than we are in the last 10 years yeah so so, so don't so, so, so maybe that's the case so in point. that's the only reason why I'm saying that is is they do not do um, city special assessed um, so we really are truly one of the only's in the state of Minnesota even those our own size Fergus Falls you know those types of places Almost everybody does developer installed, um, just because it is such a risk for the city to take that on, uh, and residents and even people looking at the lots because they don't really know um, what their specials. Uh, I mean, we we could do a city installed special assessment type of a development agreement, but again. The only way it could reduce liability for the city is it would really tie up the developer again with a number of letters of credit and default and things like that. So I don't foresee it being a benefit to them, whether they install it themselves and could probably get better prices or be put on the hook. I mean, because we really would have to shore up our city installed special assessment, and I think it would be at the cost of the developer as well. And my point is, isn't that we shouldn't go. My point is, is we just better make sure that we're very well aware yes. of what the ramifications could be. Like I, I, said, I totally I mean, agree. We and the developers are aware of it. Right, right. And like I said, I would hate to just have this come out and all of a sudden we're voting on it next week. And Correct. It's, we've changed the, changed the rules of the game. I mean, if you're interested in developing property, you've probably been thinking about this property for quite some time. How are you going to finance it? I mean, you're talking millions and millions of dollars that go into these things and to change the game on them in the last you know 30 seconds or whatever is it's it's not it's just unfair maybe is, is what I'm saying so like I said having that dialogue nothing gets nothing's a problem with having that dialogue um, like I said I I think there are problems with especially with price transparency and stuff but I've also known that having larger priced lots with everything built in can hamper the finance financing of homes too because I don't know if it's still the same but I know in the past bankers have told me we don't even look at specials we just look at the price of the property just the asset and we don't care about that so people are able to borrow more it, whether it's good or bad but that's that's the real I don't know if that's standard now but I know um, I just know there's lots of different things like there's it's a complex issue and I don't want it to be just this binary thing or whatever. Well if we have two similar lots and one has twenty thousand specials and one doesn't, your one that has twenty thousand specials is gonna be valued less. So I mean you can look at it that way. So I know you have something Mr. Larson has something quick, then you can go back to him. Mr. Larson go first. Sure, I was just gonna make a uh, make a comment. Um good points brought up here on the special assessment um, policy and uh, I think it would be interesting to look at this through an EDA lens and is is there a way to consider maybe some low interest loans for for infrastructure that, that would be potentially applicable to a residential developer to help to lower some of that upfront risk that they would take with with installing all of all of the um, municipal type of costs that are required here um, and you know it's kind of trying to find a line between the the two while also showing that we want to promote development so something to think about there I understand you're saying but you're just basically taking it from one pocket to the next if still the city is on the hook no in the long run I mean potentially but you know just to consider it as is another option to um, maybe share out share the risk rather than pushing it from one side to the other fully well, Mr. Larson thinks it's a that's a great point, and not maybe the EDA directly funding these things, but we know that at the legislature they're working on different uh, development infrastructure pro or 
grants and all those type of things. It'd be interesting to know, obviously we, the, the language isn't out there, but what happens if it needs to be the city, a city sponsored infrastructure project, then do we preclude ourselves from doing that? So if, like, could we potentially sponsor a developer to get these funds from the state? So it's not just a one pocket to the other, it's actually getting stuff from the state that we might be missing out on from if we don't, you know, champion these projects ourselves or sponsor these projects ourselves. Like I said, I'm not opposed to getting rid of assessments or a special assessment on these. I just want to make sure that we go and do it pretty clear-headed. Mr. Murphy. Mr. President, yeah, and I, those are all good points, you know, and um, I, you know, I do agree, but, you know, on a certain degree, there's really never any real good point to, to change a policy, you know, I mean, you, we got to kind of move what we move forward with, you know, with it at some point. And I do want to say that, you know, that we were able to negotiate it with that, that, uh, that one that we had and it was so I mean so it's not like it's set in stone you know there are certain things that we can we can develop uh, um, negotiate and and work with it because it, it's not really a one-size-fits-all um, the other thing as far as like the costs uh, I'm not really sure in this particular area in this market what what the cost savings is um, but I know when I was down in the working in the metro area um, the I guess this, the rule of thumb or the thought was is that the developers would say that um, uh, generally they could, the developer install costs for uh, putting in infrastructure was roughly 20% less expensive than if it were city installed, meaning we had to go out for competitive bids and do that. Whereas the developers are able to then negotiate with the the contractors and that and what they at least down there what they were experiencing was about a 20% savings over competitively bid uh, city projects so Maybe whether that's that they walk away from contracts down there <laughs> <laughs> so it, it ends up the contractor that eats the eats so, that's why they're 20% less so anyways yeah, so I mean, whether that translates up here or, or not I guess uh, I, I don't know um, and the one thing I will I will say as far as um, developers and bringing him in and developing here in the city i will tell you um, that i have been contacted and spoken to um, developers who um, are were hesitant to develop here in the city of east grand forks due to some of the um, not really knowing what the rules are um, and not having a clear set of, of what 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 we expect of the city, what we expect of the developers. And to be quite honest, they also said that in their opinion, it seemed like it was geared towards benefiting local developers versus somebody who might not be a local developer. So I guess I, I can't predict this for certain, but I do think that this might open up some of our potential development pool um, by having known, known rules and known costs. So that's all I have to say. So, you know, Mary, you mentioned feedback. So, and Mr. Murphy's looking at moving this forward to a vote. Are you asking this not be put for a vote next week, or is this set enough time for that? What you're asking for? Cause I just want to make sure, because yeah. you know, I know Mr. It, Demers made the comment too. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're it does seem a little moving abrupt. this forward to a vote, but also yeah. making sure that you allow your request for comments. Yeah, it feels a little abrupt to, to have this unveiled today and have it go to a vote in one week. It feels a little abrupt to me. And um, and I, I, I'm also with Mr. Demers, I don't oppose it. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of upside to what we're doing here for all parties, including the developers, including the final end users of those lots, including the city, um, and even some of the contractors might prefer to bid on a on a private development to just feel more comfortable with that um, we want to talk and maybe it's in here i didn't get all the way through every detail i skimmed the document but i didn't get all the way through um, i trust that we have the ability from an engineering standpoint to oversee the construction of these private infrastructure yes. and uh, to make sure it's you know compaction and dimension and everything's just to what we're expecting because eventually that will all get turned over to the city for oh, yes. maintenance and whatnot and so I, I'd like to make sure that has a thorough review also from our engineer, from legal, to make sure, yep, 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 I can do it like that. So I feel like there, uh, 
there's just a lot of a lot of little details and I would like to not have it go splat to the developers also. Are you asking it to bring it back to another work session and then to a vote? Yeah. And even maybe put it out, hopefully the media can pick up on this. It's a it's a good change. We want to be pro development, but we want to have it be, you know, maybe more toward this this way. Um, but a good chance to invite the developers in, and um, I think we're going to hear some some good things about this. Maybe some some red flags will be raised, and maybe we can even roll those in also, tweak it a little bit to their to their preference. So, I would feel better about that. Okay. Please, it's fine with you, Mr. Murphy. That's fine. Okay. Anybody else have anything for him? I see none. I guess I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Moved by Riopel, second by Johnson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, right. same sign. Motion is carried, meetings adjourned. <laughs>